Um, I am excited because this morning we're kicking off a new sermon series. It's a sermon series that's going to last the entire summer long, and we're calling it Diving Deeper. And some of you may have received a card like this when you walked in. Some of you may not, but if you didn't, you can grab it on the way out. And I will tell you, this series, we have been planning and praying over it ever since we started our last series. It was called The Red Letter Challenge. And as soon as we started The Red Letter Challenge, some of us just felt called like, oh, this is good, but we already could see that God was calling us to go deeper. And um, in the Red Letter Challenge, the basis behind that was like, okay, as followers of Jesus, if we're intended to look like Jesus, then we have to look at the words, the life, the teaching, the example of Jesus in order to do that. And so we dug through and we read select passages of those words and read in our Bible that are the words of Jesus and said, how do we apply these to our own lives? But as we were walking through that series, we could see that we needed to go deeper. And we started recognizing, okay, we are going to do a series where we read through all four of the Gospels in their entirety. And so as you walked in, if you didn't grab one of these, grab it on the way out. Because in the back, what you're going to see is this card gives a little bit of instruction. But then it also gives a reading plan. And the reading plan reads you all the way through the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which give us four different accounts of the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And we're going to read through all of those. And what that means is, in this series, we're going to be asking you to read more than you did in the last series, okay? And that's not why we're calling this Diving Deeper. Because Diving Deeper isn't just about reading more. It's about getting more out of what you read. And we talked about this in last week's message. And here's what I'm going to tell you. I know it was Memorial Day. Lots of people are out and traveling. As we know, in May, at least as a parent of a graduating senior and just as kids, May is crazy because every end of the year, school things going on. There's sports things. There's everything. But I'd encourage you, if you missed last week's message, get online and check it out. Because it started to lay a path for where we're headed in this series. And our hope for this series is to help you go a little bit deeper as you read further and further into the Bible. And the goal is not just to read it and to get information, or even to read it and think of application, but our goal is for you to read it with a heart for transformation. And we talked about that last week. And what our goal is, is this goal of transformation, is that we would read it in a way that it truly changes us. That we'd recognize that the power and the presence, the Holy Spirit is inside of us. And as we dig into the Bible and really go deeper, that it would transform us into people who look more like Jesus and less like the world around us. And our goal is that we would be living expressions of what the Apostle Paul described in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we read through the Bible, that wouldn't just be reading about those things, but that we would experience them and we would be living expressions of them to the world around us. And I'm going to tell you again, if you missed last week, I just want to encourage you, get online and check it out because it starts leading us down the path that we're going to start walking down today. And today what we're going to do is we're going to look at a passage from this week's reading. And that's what we'll do every Sunday of the summer. We'll pick a select passage, and we'll just teach on that one little piece, okay? And the reality is, you're going to have about seven chapters a week to to read through. Do the math, that's one a day. It's not a ton. And then on Sundays, we'll pick a portion and we'll teach through it. And today, we're going to start going through Matthew chapters 1 through 7. And um, here's what I'll tell you. If you are a Bible app user, are you a Bible app user? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, if you are a Bible app user, what you'll see is in the sermon notes that you got, there's a QR code. If you scan that QR code, it'll load our reading guide and our study for this summer onto your Bible app. Okay, and I'll tell you, it's great because if you do that, one, it's going to give you the whole little reading, but it's also going to make it so you can comment, you can put questions. We can interact as an online community and talk through that format, okay? If you're watching online, it was on the email that got you to this link, just scan that QR code. And here's what I'll tell you, if you are not a Bible app user, you're probably going to think I'm a young whippersnapper. I, I'm not, I know. Um, but I'm going to encourage you, get the Bible app. 
Because here's what you'll find, is it tells you what sections to read. It's also going to give you some links to videos from the Bible Project. The Bible Project is awesome. It gives you a quick overview. It gives you insight into the things you're going to read, okay? And I'll tell you, for me personally, almost daily, I use the Bible app. Because not only does it help me to track what I'm reading, sometimes it helps to direct what I'm reading. But here's the funny thing. Even though I use the Bible app, I almost daily read what it tells me to read in my actual Bible. Okay? Because I use a study Bible. And in that study Bible, as I go through and read, it gives me study notes. It gives me historical notes. It gives me correlations. It says, hey, you're reading this scripture. It refers back to this. Read this portion. It helps me to go deeper. And this is going to make me sound like an old person to the young whippersnappers. But if you don't have a paper Bible, get one. I'm serious. Get one. Get a good study Bible that will help to give you some of those notes, okay? And so both of them have a purpose. And here's the thing. Both the online version and the paper version, they can help us to do what we're longing to do in this series, and that is dive deeper into the things that we read. And if that is our goal, then it can't just be about reading and checking a box and saying that we did it. We have to read with the desire to chew on it to digest it, to take it in in a way that we don't just read it and move on, but we read it and it changes us. And so I'm going to tell you, these cards right here, I want you to grab one because they give you some directions for how to do it. They give you the basic challenge we always talk about before you read your Bible. Take time in prayer. Take time and just lay out anything that's on your heart that's getting you distracted from the Word of God that you're about to dive into. Ask God and His Holy Spirit to open your mind and your heart so you're ready for what He has for you. And then it just gives you three questions to ask as you go through. It says, hey, can you observe? Like, what are the things? What, who, why? Ask all those questions that help you to see what you're reading. And then it says, interpret it. Why is it there? What's it mean for you? These are the things we talked about last week. And then it ends by saying, what's the application? What are you supposed to do with it? And it gives you some insights in how to do that. And like I said, all throughout the summer, we're going to be working through this series. And so to get us started, like I said, I'm going to start today with just one portion from chapters 1 through 7 of the book of Matthew. And here's the funny thing. If you know anything about books 1 through 7 of Matthew, there's a whole lot in there. We can look at the birth of Jesus, okay? We could look at um, the baptism of Jesus. We could look at the introduction of John the Baptist. We could look at Jesus being tempted as he walks through the desert by the devil. We could look at the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, there are multiple years worth of sermons and things for us to study. But as I sat and I prayed and I planned for the series, I picked a passage I did not want to teach on. And I don't think any, most of you are probably going to hear and say, really, you're going to teach on that? And I am. So here's what I'm going to ask you. If you've got a Bible or an app, open it up. We're going to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to what it says. It's going to be up on the screen behind me. I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And I'm probably going to mispronounce a whole bunch of names. That's okay. You would too. Um, this is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Amminadab. Amminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Solomon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boab was the fa- Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. Okay, now I can keep reading for another nine verses. And I can mispronounce a whole other batch of names. And we could go through, but what we'd see is that in verse 16... Here's how this genealogy ends. It says, Jacob was the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary. Mary gave birth to Jesus, who's called the Messiah. You may be sitting and thinking, why in the heck are we reading through this? Why is the passage that we are teaching on? There have got to be more logical or more, more like fruitful ones that we could look at. But here's what I'll tell you. This passage right here is one of over 20 genealogies that are included in the Bible. Okay? That means it t- shows family trees. It shows a family history. It's more than one of 20. And lots of times as you read through these, how many people skim past them pretty quick? How many people skip them? 
Okay, God, I like it. Remember, lying in church, that's a bad thing, okay? Um, I'll tell you, we do. You read them, and you're just like, God, I, you know, let's get to the meat. This isn't it. But you guys, if we truly believe the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy, he says all Scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us. We talked about that last week. And that means the names included in this biblical genealogy, along with all of the others that are there, they're there for a purpose and on purpose. And if God gave them to us, we're not supposed to skim over them or just skip them. And what that means is all of those names are there for a reason. That's why I chose this passage, because while we may be tempted just to gloss over and skip them, we shouldn't, because this passage is a perfect example of what it means and how we can go deeper, and not only how, but why. But in order to see that, we're going to have to go back, and we're going to have to look at a little background information. And I know for some of you, that's the thing that, like, you geek out on. You love this part, okay? And I know there are other parts who, like, hate this. Like, Scott, just get to the lesson. But here's what I'll tell you, in order for us to dive deeper, not just this morning, but any time we dig into the Word of God, we have to be willing to do this work. And the information I'm going to share with you this morning, it's not like some special pastorly thing that only I have. It's information that's readily available to all of you guys. And so I'm just going to tell you some of that basic information. And some of it, it comes from like that Bible project video. If you scan the QR code and you start this reading plan, you'll be like, oh, I heard Pastor Scott say some of that on Sunday. It's going to be there for you. Some of this stuff, it comes from information that's in my study Bible. It gives us background information. It gives us correlations. Some of it comes from studies I've done before. They'll be like... Um, Bible commentaries, you can find them online. They're all readily available. You don't have to buy them anymore. And then, of course, our best resource is the Bible. When you read through those names and you see them, don't just gloss over and say, where do those names come from in the Bible? It gives us a chance. And here's the thing. There are tons of resources that we can use to go deeper in the Bible, but recognize this is number one, and then recognize that not all resources were created equal. Be a wise consumer of information, especially when you find it on the internet, okay? But I'm going to give you some of the information that I found as I went through. And I started preparing to read the book of Matthew, and that I think can help to prepare us as we read this genealogy. Okay, and the first one is, it's generally assumed and accepted that the book of Matthew was written by... You guys are good, okay? You got that basic information. It's written by Matthew, okay? And we know that Matthew was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus, we know that Matthew, before he was a disciple, he was a tax collector, okay? That was a hated person by his Jewish brethren, okay? He was seen as a traitor. He was the lowest of the low. He was a person who was on the outside. But as Jesus walked through that town, Jesus saw Matthew, looked him in the eye, and said, come and follow. And Matthew took him up on the offer. And because he did, he had a front row seat to the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And he didn't just get to sit there and observe it. He actually got to take part in it. Okay? And for the first 30 to 40 years after the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus, all of the stories of what Jesus did, they weren't written down and recorded. They were orally taught. People would tell them and pass them on. People would memorize them, and they would pass them on. And so they originally weren't written down until eventually the four Gospels were then recorded. And it's generally accepted by biblical scholars that Matthew was one of the very first that was recorded. Okay? But here's what you need to know. The stories and the details that are recorded in Matthew, they are not necessarily recorded in a chronological format. But here's what I'll tell you. They were recorded in a very intentional format. And part of the reason and part of the intentional format that he did is Matthew knew who he was writing this book for. He was writing it for a primarily Jewish audience. He was writing it for Jewish people who'd grown up in this Jewish faith but who did not yet know Jesus. And because of that, Matthew includes tons of references to the Old Testament and to Old Testament prophecies and Old Testament people. And he intentionally included references and details that would help his Jewish audience see that Jesus truly was the fulfillment of the Messiah that they've been waiting for. And that he didn't just come to save Jewish people, but that he would save all people and that he truly was Emmanuel, God with us, God in the flesh in human form. 
And since it had been over 400 years at this point, since they'd heard any prophecies, like those Old Testament ones, he knew that he had to make these references so that people could see the connection, so they could see how Jesus fulfilled them. And in doing so, this is the big part, what Matthew knew he needed to do was to help these Jewish people see that if they chose to follow Jesus, they weren't leaving their Jewish faith. They were actually continuing down the path, the path that their Jewish faith had always been pointing them towards. And it was the God who created them, who called them, and who loved them. And that's where this genealogy comes into play. Because it helped those people connect the dots between the birth of the nation of Israel to the birth of Jesus. He lists, I forget, 48 or 62 different people in there. It covers a span of about 2,000 years. By giving those names, he's like, here's the birth of our nation. Here's the birth of Jesus. Follow the dots. And we need to know that. And here's the thing. He starts the genealogy by listing two names. He lists Abraham and King David because that refers them to two of the prophecies that they all would have known because God had promised that the world would be blessed by the family of Abraham and he said that the Messiah would come from the royal line of King David. And so that's where he literally starts and it's 46 different people that he lists from the start of the nation of Israel to the birth of Jesus. And all of those names literally are, it's just like follow the dots. You guys, look at him. Here is who Jesus is, and he truly is the Messiah we've been waiting for. And that's part of why Matthew took the time to list all those names, because he didn't want them to miss that. But here's the funny thing is they followed those dots, and they saw that it led to Jesus. There's some of those dots that would have stuck out to him like a sore thumb. Okay, because here's what you got to know is in that time and in that culture, when they listed genealogies, they would have listed men and upright men. They would have listed the heroes and the forefathers of their faith and of their nation. But as they read through this list, they quickly would have seen that that's not what Matthew did. Because Matthew also women and foreigners. And that would have seemed so strange to them because they treated genealogies kind of like we do with the pictures that we post or the pictures that some of us old people still print, okay? Um, I don't choose the pictures where somebody's picking their nose. I don't choose the picture where my kids are fighting. I choose the picture where we look like a perfect little family, okay? And I think you guys do the same. And if you would look at a genealogy from this time, that's what they would have listed, the people that they wanted everyone to see, the heroes and the forefathers of their faith and of their nation. But Matthew doesn't do that. We read the name Tamar. She wasn't just a woman, she was a widow. And she was a widow who, if you read your Bible, you know she goes to some pretty extreme measures in order to have a child as a widow. And that child is listed as a part of this genealogy. There's Rahab. Rahab wasn't just a woman, she was a woman who was a foreigner. And she was a prostitute. In the list, we hear adulterers, we hear murderers, we hear evil kings. And here's the crazy thing, we hear everyday normal people. So to them would have just been like your average Joe. Matthew lists them all. And to his audience, that would have seemed strange. But again, he does it on purpose and for a purpose. Because Matthew wanted his audience to see that we have an equal opportunity, God. He doesn't rule you out by your age, your ethnicity, your gender. He doesn't rule you out by mistakes from your past. He knows the worst of the worst of your sin, and he still says, do you know what? Not only can I use you, but I will use you if you let me. And there were people in Matthew's day that needed to hear that. Because that culture that day didn't just promote like the men and the forefathers and their genealogies. They lived in a society that did that. There were women, there were foreigners, there were people who were sick, there were people like Matthew, who wrote this book, who as a tax collector, he would have been written off. No one ever would have expected God to use a person like that. And these people back in that day, they needed to hear that they weren't excluded by any of those factors. And that they were not only welcome in the kingdom of God, but that they would be instrumental in ushering in the kingdom of God. They were the very lives that led up to Jesus. And I'll tell you, there's people here today who still need to hear the same message. 
And here's, I think, the bigger point. There may not be people, I believe there are people in here who need to hear that message. But here's what I'll tell you, there are people out there who need to hear that message. Because what they believe the message of the church is, you don't belong in here and God doesn't use people like you. And you guys, we're supposed to be like Matthew where we help him see, no, there is nothing that you can bring to the table that the good news of Jesus Christ isn't bigger than. We need to be reminded of that. I believe someone in here this morning needs to be reminded the stuff of your past does not end what you are going to do and what God is going to do with you. He can take that and he can use it on purpose and for a purpose. Don't you dare write yourself off because God has not written you off. And if you think you can be removed from that call, then you're believing a lie of the enemy. And he would love us to believe that we can't be used by God. And so I'll tell you, no matter where you're from, don't listen to those limitations. This genealogy, that's part of the reason it's there. So we can hear that message and we can be reminded of that. And here's the thing, I think we need to be reminded of that, not just for our own personal lives, but I'm going to say it again. I think we need to be reminded that this applies to every life out around us. That just like nothing we bring to the table can write us off by being used by God. Well, guess what? That means the person that you feel so differently than and that you can't understand why they do what they do, why they vote how they vote, whatever it might be, don't you dare write them off because God can use them too. And while the world loves for us to think we have to be divided by our differences, we are going to be different. We're going to have different opinions. But here's what I'll tell you. As followers of Jesus, those differences do not have to divide us. We've looked at it over and over and over. As Jesus prepares to the cross, what does he do? He prays that we would be unified, that we would be as close as he is with God the Father. Even in our differences. And I'll tell you, if you want to know one of the reasons we need to read through this genealogy, there it is. Because we look at him, we see this crazy mix of different people. And what we see is they all led to Jesus, who then ushered in the kingdom of God here on earth. And here's what I'll tell you. I'm standing out looking at a crazy mix of people. And, and I don't just say that jokingly. Like, I know some of you, you lean way this direction. Some of you lean way that direction. You all live lives in different ways. But here's what I'll tell you. In that crazy mix, our mix doesn't even come close to what Matthew lists in that genealogy. And I think we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be the modern-day mix of people that lead others to Jesus and that usher in the kingdom of God until Jesus Christ himself returns and ushers it in in its totality. Think about that. Are we willing to be those people? What does it mean to be those people? What's it look like to be those people? I'll tell you, I think about that for us often. It's the only reason I do this job. That's what we're supposed to be. It's what we're called to be. And I personally believe that we are the perfect mix of imperfect people <laughs> that are here for a purpose, on purpose, to lead others to Jesus and to help usher in the kingdom of God. And that we're supposed to be united by the one who created us, who called us, and who has redeemed us. And today... It might be a little bit of a shorter service, but here's the reality. What I want us to see is the service doesn't end in here. It's the last thing it's supposed to do. We're supposed to be that living service out there. I'm going to ask our worship team to come up. We did two songs of worship this morning. We're going to end with a third song of worship. Um, and we're going to do it after we gather together as a unified body of believers and take part in communion. And it's a communion Sunday. It's a time where we get to remember why nothing we bring to the table can overcome Jesus Christ. We get to remember what the good news is. We get to remember that on the night of his betrayal, he sat and he gathered with another weird mix of people. He sat with these 12 disciples who were wildly different, okay? Matthew himself is the very example of that. 
And he called them together and they gathered around a table. And actually the reality is it probably wasn't a table. They gathered on the ground and they shared a meal. And as they sat there and they shared that meal, he talked about not only what he was going to do, but why he was going to do it. Listen to how it's described by Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. I'd read it from this Bible. People wonder why I don't read the Bi- from my Bible. It's because I'm old and my eyes are terrible. So I print it really big here where I can read it. And here's what it says in that big print. It says, on the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Ever since that night with that weird mix of people, other weird mixes of people have been coming together. Mixes of people that are so wildly different, but they gather together and they're unified by their belief that on that night, Jesus Christ described how he would give his life. That he would willingly hand his life over as a payment and a sacrifice for our sins. And that it didn't end there with just this grand show of his love for us, but that he rose again as a demonstration of his power over life and death. And as he said, do this in remembrance of me, that we would gather in our differences and we'd be reminded by what unites us. We'd be reminded that his sacrifice trumps everything and that we can gather and remember that. And here's what I'll tell you, in just one minute, if you walked in and you didn't receive one of these, it's our communion elements. If you raise your hand, somebody can bring you one. But in one minute, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Rather than me leading you through the taking of these elements, which sometimes we do, I'm just going to ask you to quiet your heart and take time and pray. This is intended for people who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it means you have the Holy Spirit within you. If you have the Holy Spirit within you, quiet yourself and listen for his voice. Ask him how and where he's asking you to lead others to Jesus how and where you're supposed to usher in the kingdom of God to a world that desperately needs it. And after you take that time, then just on top, it's the wafer it represents the body of Christ, broken for us. We do this in remembrance of him. And the cup is the juice, it represents his blood that he said he would give for the forgiveness of many. That means the forgiveness of us. It means for the forgiveness of the people outside these doors. Drink it in remembrance of him. We'll have a few minutes of just quiet while you do that, and then join us in the final song of worship. Belief is one thing, living lives that demonstrate that belief for another. And as, as I plan for this sermon series, here's what I'll tell you. I always call it a sermon series. And and then we give you stuff to read at home, but I don't like using the term a Bible study. And it's not that that's a bad, I know some people are like, oh, that's a great thing. It is. Um, But as I was praying over this over the last month, just multiple times I kept remembering a story. How many people have heard of a guy named Bob Goff? In fact, he came and spoke at Riverside a couple years back. Um, Bob Goff is, um, he's an author, but before he was an author, he was a lawyer. Before he was a lawyer, he was a lover of Jesus Christ. And he is a wild and crazy lover of Jesus Christ. He's written a couple different books, but I love because here's what he said. One time he said he'd been doing Bible studies for years, and one night as he left a Bible study, it started to kind of wig him out because as much as he knew about God, he felt like he was more of a stalker of God than a friend of God. And he's like, I can study this thing. I can learn a new Greek word, a new Hebrew word. I can know all these things. But the reason he felt like a stalker is he said, think about what a stalker does. A stalker observes from a distance and learns as much as he or she can, but they keep at a distance. He said, I don't want to be a stalker. I don't want to know about him. I want to know him. I want to be like a friend. I want to be like a lover where you don't just 
watch them from a distance, you interact and do life with them. And so he challenged his friends. He said, let's quit doing a Bible study. Let's start doing a Bible doing. And that's my challenge as we go through this series. It's awesome to dig deeper, to dive deeper, to gain knowledge. But if that knowledge doesn't change what we do, then again, I challenge you that it's wasted. So go out, let it change you. Um, as we close today, we've started the tradition that after communion, we'll continue communing around food. We have a potluck out there. Lots of times I would say, let's let our senior people go first, like senior citizens, our older generation. Let's honor them and let them go first. But today, since it's senior celebration, let's start with our graduating seniors and then go to our elder people, go out, be a family, be united by Christ. If you need prayer, come this direction, and we look forward to seeing you guys next Sunday. Thank you, and God bless.